In this video, we shall be talking about hypocalcemia in children, which is quite common, especially in critically ill children. So, you must understand that calcium is available in the body in three forms. First is the protein bound form, which is up to the tune of around 50%, 30 to 50%, they say. A diffusible non ionized form up to the extent of 5 to 15%, which is complexed with serum anions like phosphate, citrate, and sulfates. And the ionized form, which is the physiologically active form, which is constitutes around 40 to 60 percent. So, majorly protein bound and ionized bound iron calcium form the major part of the calcium, and the diffusible non ionized form is very small in amount. But you must remember that in patients with hypoalbuminemia, you can get fallacious values of calcium because you know that approximately 50 percent of it is albumin bound. So, in that case, you have to calculate the corrected calcium levels by this formula. Corrected calcium levels is calcium measured plus 0.8 into 4 minus albumin measured. The normal values of serum calcium, total values are 9 to 11 milligram per deciliter and if you translate in milliequivalents per liter is 4.5 to 5.5 and ionized have the values of 4.25 to 5.25 milligram per deciliter or 2.2 to 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. Calcium basically has actions on five major organ systems. First is the neuromuscular in which is it is responsible for the normal neuromuscular excitability. Second is normal myocardial contractility that is on the heart. Third is it mediates the cellular permeability and action of various drugs and hormones. So action at the cellular enzymatic and hormonal level. Fourth is it mediates various steps in the coagulation of blood and it helps in bone and teeth formation. You must also have a fair idea about the metabolism of calcium in the body. So the metabolism is mainly governed by three hormones. First is the parathyroid hormone which is released from the parathyroid glands. Second is the calcitonin hormone from the thyroid gland and third is the vitamin D which is produced in the skin. The metabolism mainly occurs in kidney intestines as also the liver which is involved in the metabolism of vitamin D and bone. It also helps in releasing calcium from the stone. Bone is the major storehouse of calcium. So kidneys, they retain the magnesium and calcium and increase phosphate excretion. They convert 25-hydroxy-D to 125-dihydroxy-D. The intestines, they absorb dietary calcium and vitamin D and uh, vitamin D helps in increasing the serum levels of calcium by increasing absorption from the intestine. Bone, it is the major storehouse of calcium. And if a hormone like parathormone is functioning on it, then it causes bone resorption and increases the calcium levels in blood by causing the resorption of bone. And calcitonin in turn causes deposition of calcium to the bone and decreases the serum calcium levels. The function of liver is to convert vitamin D from the diet or from the skin to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the major, major storage form of vitamin D. Now, hypocalcemia is defined as serum calcium less than 4.5 milliequivalents per liter, less than 9 milligrams per deciliter, or an ionized calcium value less than 2.2 or milliequivalents per liter of less than 4.25 milligrams per deciliter. Why is it important to know about hypocalcemia? Because it is associated with higher mortality in critically ill children and it is easily correctable if you have clear idea about that about it. So, principal causes are inadequate intake of calcium, vitamin D, malabsorption, chronic diarrhea, renal failure, any kind of hormonal dysfunction, especially related to the three hormones I discussed previously, ionic chelation by saturated blood transfusion and in patients with alkalosis. So, the principal clinical features in children are paresthesia, so fingers, toes and perioral regions. Severe cases can produce irritability, tetany, even seizures. Laryngospasm, bronchospasm, apnea, cyanosis, arrhythmias, hypotension, and bleeding due to coagulation defects. Features of associated abnormality or morbidity can also be present in the child. For example, frontal bossing, wrist, widening, rachitic, rosary, etc. in patients with rickets. And prolonged hypocalcemia can also lead to pathological fractures. Remember, the signs and symptoms are basically due to dysfunction of the calcium-dependent excitable tissues, that is nervous tissue, cardiac tissue and the skeletal muscle tissue. Also, there are two important signs which are majorly asked at the MBBS level. First is the Schwastik sign, in which facial muscle contraction is elicited on percussion of the facial nerve below the zygomatic arch. 
and next is the Trousseau sign in which a carpal buttal spasm occurs on compression of the arms and or legs by the blood pressure cuff in patients with hypocalcemia. For diagnosis, you must take a focused clinical history and examination, especially of bones and joints. This most of the time helps you in diagnosing the chronic cases and laboratory investigations which are serum calcium in which you should go for both total and ionized values because ionized is the physiologically active form. Serum phosphorus, serum albumin, I told you it is very important because in patients of hypoalbuminemia you will get fallacious calcium values. Serum alkaline phosphatase and others like renal function test, serum parathormone, magnesium levels, importance of magnesium I will be discussing soon, urine calcium creatinine ratio and vitamin D levels. Now, this is an investigative approach I found to be very useful in one of these papers I was going through. So, first test you must order besides serum calcium. So, once you have confirmed that hypocalcemia is there, you should next test you should go for a serum phosphate. If it is low, in patient of hypocalcemia, the likely diagnosis is vitamin D deficiency. And in patient of hypocalcemia with high serum phosphate, it suggests hypoparathyroidism or pseudo hypoparathyroidism if inconclusive you should go for serum parathormone levels if low it suggests true hypoparathyroidism and if high it suggests the normal response to hypocalcemia so this will not uh, lead to any pathological cause then urine calcium creatinine ratio if the values are low with appropriately increased parathormone levels, then it suggests the normal physiological or bodily response to hypocalcemia. Low value of urine calcium creatinine ratio otherwise would suggest a renal dysfunction. A high ratio, high urine calcium creatinine ratio along with high serum phosphate in the blood would suggest tubular unresponsiveness, which in turn means it is a case of pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Then vitamin D levels, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. If they are low, obviously it suggests vitamin D deficiency. And 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, you don't have to get investigated at the initial stages. It is very rarely you need to get them and get it investigated. And if it is low, then it suggests a mutation in 1 alpha hydroxylase enzyme. That is a genetic cause. And if it is high, then again it suggests a likely genetic cause which is end organ resistance to vitamin D. On ECG, you will find a lengthened ST segment and a prolonged QT interval. That is, uh, the duration of ventricular depolarization and repolarization will be prolonged in patients with hypocalcemia. Treatment of acute symptomatic hypocalcemia comprises of giving IV 10% calcium gluconate 100-200 mg per kg which equates to 9 to 18 mg per kg of elemental calcium ion that is 1 to 2 ml per kg of elemental calcium ion in short over 10 to 20 minutes but under strict cardiac that is heart rate and rhythm monitoring along followed by this you have to give calcium gluconate 10 to 30 mg per kg per hour for prevention of symptoms with close monitoring of total and ionized calcium to be discontinued when become when they become normal and the entire infusion and bolus dose should be given very very slow not more than 1 to 3 ml per minute to avoid hypotension bradycardia and other kinds of cardiac dysrhythmias iv calcium should always be diluted in 5 or 10 percent dextrose but not in normal saline since sodium encourages renal calcium ion loss so unnecessarily you won't be able to correct the calcium properly they also remember that IV calcium solutions are incompatible with sodium bicarbonate because calcium cation and bicarbonate anion will precipitate to form calcium carbonate. So IV calcium and sodium bicarbonate should never be administered via the same line. Most of the time this happens during CPR in patients and the residents they don't know. So you must take precaution. Now a word about the formulations available. See, calcium gluconate is the preferred formulation. Calcium chloride provides more ionized calcium than calcium gluconate. But it is more irritating to the subcutaneous tissue and causes sloughing if inadvertent infiltration occurs in the subcutaneous tissue. So we avoid using it. Calcium carbonate, it also causes GI upset due to carbon dioxide formation. So it is also not used. Now, 
treatment of asymptomatic hypocalcemia that is that which you detect incidentally comprises of starting oral calcium at the rate of 50 mg per kg in 3 to 4 divided doses and which is titrated up accordingly and oral calcium supplements with vitamin D should be given 30 minutes prior to meals to improve the absorption the gastrointestinal absorption of calcium if there is associated hypomagnesemia then you must give IV max self 50% 0.1 to 0.2 ml per kg that is 50 to 100 mg per kg slow IV over 30 minutes to 1 hour period and the dose can be repeated every 12 to 24 hours remember the mechanism by which magnesium uh, hypomagnesemia leads to hypocalcemia is by not only inhibiting parathormone secretion also by but also by producing resistance to parathormone action at the level of the bone and kidneys along with this you need to give a calcium rich diet in asymptomatic hypercalcemic patients or long term man management of symptomatic patients which principally includes milk and milk products containing vitamin D also dates are very good care should be taken while giving calcium to patients on digoxin since an elevated serum calcium enhances the action of digoxin and thus digitalis toxicity may occur so in short you must remember that IV therapy is usually not required in asymptomatic especially in asymptomatic patients because bone is a major storage organ system for calcium and a large reserve of calcium is present in the bone but vitamin D and albumin are must for the utilization of calcium so even if calcium is present in the body the utilization requires vitamin D and albumin and symptomatic hypocalcemia can precipitate if the deficiency of these two is there so these are the various formulations of calcium which are present in the market and the quantity of calcium in each you can go through them so what is the therapeutic relevance a possibility of hypocalcemia should always be considered investigated and treated in critically ill children particularly those with congestive cardiac failure or shock and especially the refractory cases so thank you so much for a patient watching and please do share the knowledge thanks a lot